of mountain and field Come shower on us blessings and light The wonders that nature befriended can yield Reveal to our hearing and sight your melodies whispering joy on the air affirm that God's everywhere. Oh, there was a woodland of mountain and field. Be with us in blessing this night. With a prayer. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Great Masters, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar, Paramahansa Yogananda, Friend and Guide Swami Kriyananda, Saints of all religions, humbly we bow to you all. Divine Mother, help us to feel thy presence. Help us to feel your energy coming through in our voices, coming through in our energies, coming through to uplift and inspire. We are thy children. Bring us home. Om. Peace. Amen. Good morning. Morning here in the U.S., wherever you are. We're here for some storytelling. We're going to have a series of stories and songs that will be sung live, just like the Woodland Dave is there that Sai Ganesh and Tandava gave us. We're going to have stories from several different traditions. They won't necessarily be strung together. They'll be independent, several of us, five of them in particular. And we'll have some, some correlations, some perhaps moral or spiritual truths or lessons that you might be able to take from it. Or maybe you just want to enjoy the stories, however it is. We'll let you enjoy it. So I'm going to begin with a Christian saint, St. Patrick of Ireland. I grew up, at least we identified ourselves as Irish. So as a little kid, it was St. Patrick's Day, March 17th. It was about wearing green and having corned beef, cabbage, soda bread, those kinds of things. A little bit older, many people drink a lot of beer, especially here in the U.S., on St. Patrick's Day to identify themselves, real or imagined, as Irish. But I also know from the first time that I went to Ireland that he is one of the most revered people who has ever walked on the earth. That March 17th used to be a day when the pubs and the, the bars, as it were, would close down. Such a completely different experience of March 17th versus my experience here in the U.S. And I realized I really didn't know that much about him. There's the common story that he chased the snakes out of Ireland. Another one that is a little less common is that he used the, the clover leaf, the three leaves of the clover, to explain to the, the druids and the pagans of the time the Holy Trinity, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. What we do know is that he lived in the 5th century in the 400s. Not a lot of writings from that time. He himself wrote a very short biographical part. James, we're having some crippling technical difficulties. Can you cover your audio is still coming through? Can you just tell people we're going to restart in one minute? Okay, people, we're having some technical difficulties, so we're going to restart in just a minute, so bear with us.
From the prayer or the introduction? Just the, from the introduction. Okay. Is not why TV producers don't like to go live. They want everything on tape. Hello and welcome. Apologize, we had some technical difficulties. We're back. Hopefully everything is coming through, both audio and visual for you. So we're going to start again, although we, we had an opening song, in case you missed that, but we had Woodland Davis that Saiganesh and Tondava sang. This is a morning of storytelling. We're gonna have five of us tell different stories and we'll have some songs interspersed. The stories are distinct in and each and of themselves. They'll be coming from several different traditions. And I'm gonna start off with a story of St. Patrick of Irish folklore, but, and that's the other point. Some of these might be more folklore, some of these might be more historical, and some might be a little bit of both. And St. Patrick's story is probably one of those a little bit of both. I grew up Irish, or at least identifying myself as Irish here in the US. Both my grandmothers were Irish. So March 17th, St. Patrick's Day, was as a little kid was about wearing green. It was about my mother cooking corned beef, cabbage, soda bread, oh, love soda bread. A little bit later on, myself and many people partake in beer drinking to identify themselves as maybe actual or maybe just imagined being Irish. As later as an adult, when I traveled to Ireland and I realized just how revered St. Patrick was, right up there with anybody in all of humanity. That literally on St. Patrick's Day, the pubs and the, the local bars as were, would close down, just like it was a high holy day, right up there with Christmas and Easter. I couldn't quite reconcile that difference between being Irish in the US versus this reverence for St. Patrick. So I set out to learn a little bit. Most people, I certainly had heard this story, that identify St. Patrick as the guy who chased the snakes out of Ireland. Another story of maybe a little bit less well-known that he used the clover leaf, the three rings of the clover leaf, to explain the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, explaining that to the Druids and the pagans of his time. His time is the fifth century, the 400s. Very little writing occurred in that time. We have a short biography that he himself wrote. Um, one of his peers of the time also wrote a little bit, although he wrote a lot of things, only a little bit about St. Patrick. So we're relying on sort of these verbal stories that were carried down over the centuries. Some of which is true, some of which is maybe true, some of which is clearly not true. And that's actually where I wanna start of what is not true. The snakes, it's not St. Patrick. Archeologists tell us that the snakes have been gone from Ireland since at least the last ice age, 10 or 15,000 years ago. That story of the Holy Trinity and the cloverleaf wasn't written down, at least that anybody can find, until the 1700s, over 1500 years after St. Patrick lived. 
It's not to say that he didn't use it because the, the pagans of the time had no concept of God and Holy Spirit and all that stuff. They had the Druids, which is this ancient, had been around for thousands of years at that point. So he may have, but I would think that somebody would have written it down if he had. Also, his name was not Patrick. He was not Irish. Best of all, he is not a saint. <laughs> so who was he? Is this story just about truth and what is true and let me discern? Well, maybe. So what was he? Well, I keep saying he because there was an actual guy. He did actually live. His name was Maywin Sukat or something like that. I may not have the pronunciation quite right, but close enough. Maywin is a Scottish Gaelic name. He's from that area of Scotland, or at least northern England as we know it today. And he grew up in a Christian household. His grandfather was a priest. That was actually normal at the time for priests to be married and have kids. But he himself describes it that he was not a good Christian. He didn't have a, a regular practice, as it were. When he was 16 years old, he was taken by pirates away from his family. I know it sounds very dramatic, but this is what he wrote himself. He was brought to Ireland and sold into slavery. So now he's a slave. He's in a land that he knows nothing about. The people in the culture speak a language he doesn't know anything about. He can't speak the language. He doesn't know anything of what's going on. Think of somebody you know who's 16 years old, illiterate, no money, pulled from his family, un didn't want to go, and forced into this laborious situation where he's literally sent up into the mountains, into the wilderness to care for sheep and lambs and so on and so forth, had to have been a scary, scary, scary situation. What did he have? Well, even though he was not a good Christian, as he phrased it, he did know how to pray. And he prayed. And he prayed a lot. A hundred times a day. That's how he described it. I prayed a hundred times a day. Now think about that. Every five or ten minutes for ten hours, he was saying another prayer. He doesn't say what he prayed, what the words were, how he prayed, what he was asking for. It really doesn't matter. He was praying to God. He had a faith in God, probably coming from his grandfather, that was so strong, that's what carried him through that very, very difficult time. A hundred times a day praying, and then at night, he would pray a hundred times more. Now, I don't know about you, I, I say a lot of prayers, but I'm nowhere near a hundred times a day, plus another hundred times at night. That faith, I, I cannot imagine how strong that faith was. But here's what happened. He wasn't necessarily getting anything back. There's some stories about maybe that occurred during this time when he was a slave. Maybe they occurred later in his life. We're not really clear. But what he describes is this went on for six years, and then he got his first of two spiritual experiences where God spoke to him. Was it an actual answer to a prayer? We don't know. But this first message, six years, so he's now in his early 20s. Think about somebody you know who's in their early 20s, praying to God a hundred times a day, and gets this message, your ship is in. That's it. I mean, there might have been a few words, but he's in the mountains. He's 200 miles away from the nearest port. He has no money. He's a slave. He can't just wander off. What's he going to do? Well, we don't really know exactly how he got there, but he got to a ship. He somehow talked his way on. I like to think that there was a lot of divine guidance here. Divinely guided how to get to whatever port he went to, probably around Dublin or at least that southeastern part of Ireland. Somehow divinely guided, guided to get onto the ship, brought over to Wales, as near as we can best tell. And then he had another couple hundred mile trip overland to get back to his family up near or in Scotland. And he had this reunited. He was reunited with his family there. Now he was doing all this prayer, all this time of trouble, but as he was reunited with his family, he continued the prayer. He continued this, this faith in God. Now the, the Italians of, of this day and age are known for this, this devotion and this, this 
Christness that they bring into everyday life. Well, the Irish are that way too. And St. Patrick played a, an important part of that happening, and it starts with his faith. And that brings us to the second message that he got. And we don't know exactly when this was. Some people say he was in his 40s, meaning 20 years later. A lot of other people think it was more in his late 20s. He continued this prayer. Maybe it was 100 times a day. We're not really sure. But he continued this prayer over everything. Prayer that led to supposedly some miracles. There was one guy who was cured of blindness. Uh, wolves who would steal lambs, he would pray, and then the wolves would bring the lambs back. I, we're not really certain. But what he described is he got the second message. It was quite a bit more complex than the first message of your ship is in. The second message was this prayer that was answered by a voice coming out of an envelope of all things. Now, he's illiterate, so he can't read. But he hears his voice coming through him. Return to Ireland. That's the first part. And the second part is, and become a priest. Now, becoming a priest in the 400s, I don't know exactly what all was entailed, but I do know you had to speak and write Latin. He didn't. Somehow he was, again, I think of it as divinely guided. He got to France, and that's where he became a priest. He was ordained there. And he returned to the land where he had been enslaved, where he did all this labor on this mission to convert the pagans to Christianity. His faith was so strong that he somehow knew that he would be successful in converting these people using the three-leaf clover, maybe, perhaps, I don't know. But what I'm sure happened is that faith carried him through. More importantly, it was hearing that message, hearing the, having that experience of God, those two experiences of God, one in a time of great difficulty, one in a time of he didn't necessarily need anything, but God needed something of him. And so he served, he gave of himself. So he left everything behind and he spent the last 30 years of his life almost entirely in Ireland, converting the pagans, converting the Druids, I don't know how easy it would be to convert the Druids, but I can't imagine it was easy. They had been there for thousands and thousands of years at that point. They didn't really have a god or gods, but he converted, he converted them. He was very successful in that way. We know, and today, if a priest were to walk in whatever room and say, hello, Father, well, a, a sort of loose Gaelic term for Father is Padrick or Patrick. That's how he got the name Patrick. So everyone just called him as father. He established churches up and down the island, all throughout that land. Christianity became what it is today, first and foremost, because of St. Patrick. So that's how he got his name. How did he get to be a saint when the Catholic Church never canonized him? There's this thing, I actually hadn't heard of it for, I, didn't grow, I grew up Catholic, but I hadn't heard of this, with the apostles. With the, I mean, you think of the 12 apostles, the 12 original disciples, that to be with the apostles is to be held in the esteem as if you were one of the apostles. Mary Magdalene is one of them. Um, Helena of Constantinople, she's the one, she's the mother of Constantine, the one who really made the Christianity the norm within the Roman Empire. She's the one who, for those who know the story, and the who found the cross that was in the area where Jesus was crucified. She found the cross. She was divinely guided to find it. She also is with the apostles. That's what St. Patrick is. He is with the apostles. I don't know why the Catholic Church has not canonized him. I think of that status, as it were, of with the apostles as something even more than being a saint. Clearly, that faith, that strong faith, he was with God. He was guided by God. For me personally, that's inspiring. That's something to get me to establish my relationship with God in such a personal way that I can hear God, I can experience God in so many different ways to maybe not affect ultimately millions and millions of people, but even just to affect me. So hopefully this has been a helpful story of St. Patrick to bring about this sense of faith in you. Blessings to you.
And fittingly for St. Patrick, we have a song of the Emerald Isle, which is in fact called Emerald Isle. Come here while I sing you of emerald hills, of valleys and meadows so fair, that all who have seen them have carried away memories in their hearts, friends like the lilacs of May. Oh, my song is the story of the lilacs of May. My song is the story of deer on the hills, of larks that soar seeking the sun, of nightingales lifting the curtain of night as with music they bring down heaven's blessing of light oh my song is the story of god's blessing of light come join me in singing of that emerald isle of flowers that like jewels be sprinkled holly, of waterfalls eager to embrace the white sea as we with our maker united would be as we with our maker reunited would be Come here while I sing you of emerald hills, of valleys and meadows so fair, that all who have seen them have carried away memories in their hearts, friends, like the lilacs of May. Oh, my song is the story of the lilacs of May. Thank you, James and Tandava. That was beautiful. I'm going to now take our storytelling across the sea and to a different continent over to India. And I'd like to share a few stories from the life of Lord Rama, who I have always found inspiring ever since I was a boy. My parents would read to me the stories of the Ramayana and the Mahabharata when I was a child. And I didn't understand their allegory at the time, but I understood the symbolism and the heroism that they embodied. And they have always stood as great inspirations for me. And actually just recently I have experimented with tuning in more deeply to Rama's consciousness, to that incarnation of the Lord. And one thing that I find particularly beautiful about the life of Lord Rama was from the way the story is told, everybody knew who he was that they knew he was a descent of spirit, that he was an avatar, that he was you know, a Christ-like being in his awareness. And what's actually fun is apparently in the original text of the Ramayana, they actually include Lord Rama's astrological birth chart. And so as a budding astrologer, I found that incredibly interesting and I've actually studied his birth chart. And every planet in his birth chart is either in a place of exaltation or of second best place. And it just, it just, exudes king, king of God. And uh, it's actually been, it was a great gift for me to be able to see his birth chart because it helped me tune into his consciousness more. And one thing I love about the life of Lord Rama is he had 
within him that complete power of a self-realized avatar, but yet he always was perfectly self-restrained and always acted in adherence to dharma and never flaunted his power or made himself appear greater than his fellow man. But he always, just like all of the great masters, would just shine the light of spirit to welcome others into embracing his state of consciousness. So I'll share a few stories from his life that I have enjoyed. Some of them I've read, some of them I've only heard, and so forgive me if some of these stories are inaccurate or if I've fudged some of the details, but I think you'll enjoy the spirit of them anyway. So once when Lord Rama was growing up and he needed a wife, he was a young prince and was going was he was the heir apparent to the throne of Ayodhya and a nearby king had a daughter Sita and those of us who know know that Sita was actually the incarnation of Lakshmi and Rama the incarnation of Vishnu and so they were destined to be together so Rama went out to go compete for the hand of Sita in marriage because apparently it was a tradition at that time that the the young men would come and would compete in a whole array of martial events to try and show their prowess and their skill. And then the bride-to-be could choose a husband. And so Rama goes to this Swayamvara and he competes. And of course his strength and his prowess and his abilities are far beyond mere mortals, as it were. But he's still trying to act with like a degree of humility and without drawing too much attention to himself. But finally, there, the, the great test is to see if anyone can lift the bow of Lord Shiva and string the bow. And in the story, it's said that the bow of Lord Shiva is so heavy that even to pick it up would be a superhuman feat of strength. And one by one, all of, the, all of the young swains come up and they try and pick the bow and they struggle and they strain and they pull and they heave and it doesn't even budge an inch. And Lord Rama just waits and he waits for everyone to try his turn. And then when everyone is finished, he nimbly stands up to his feet and as he is ascending the dais where the bow is rested, his brother Lakshman, who sometimes acted as a little bit of a PR guy, cries out, Rama's going to lift the bow! And Rama looks at him and it's okay. I will let my deeds speak for themselves, he says with just a look at his brother. And reaching down, Lord Rama picks up the bow of Shiva with a single movement and without breaking that graceful flow of energy, he not only picks up the bow, but he strings it. And the whole audience gasps because he has already done what no other could do. And then, to prove his prowess and his mastery over the bow of Shiva, he draws the string back, which again is just a exponentially more than any other has been able to do. And then as he draws the string back to his ear to the completion of the bow, the bow snaps in two. And Rama proves that he is not only worthy of Sita's hand, but that he has mastered the universe. And this is my own personal hypothesis, because I haven't read anyone comment on this other than some friends of mine, but I think that bow symbolizes the spine, as it often does in the Bhagavad Gita. And so I think what this was symbolizing was that to win the hand of Sita, to win the love of Divine Mother, to win that power, that grace of God, we have to be able to unite the two poles of our spine, the kundalini and the spiritual eye. And so many men who tried before couldn't even pick up their spine and couldn't even sit in meditation for the attempt, which Lord Rama could do at will and instantly. And then not only was he able to string the bow to connect the two poles in his spine, but he could shatter the limitations of that form and go beyond all creation because he was the Lord of all the universe. He was God himself incarnate. I love some of the stories of Rama, like I said, because everyone seems to know that he's Vishnu himself, that he is God. I actually saw, this is a little bit of a side tangent, but in another part of the story, Ram and Sita are banished, which is a great tragedy for all the people because they would make the ideal rulers because they're, they are divine. And they are banished by a series of unfortunate events and have to wander for many years. 
And during that wandering phase, a demon king, Ravana, becomes interested and infatuated with Sita, who is the most beautiful woman in all the world. And Ravana devises a scheme to steal Sita away from Rama and from his brother Lakshman, which he manages to do. And when Rama is carrying Sita away to his city and a flying chariot, as they're flying through the air, Sita is crying out for help to be rescued. And in the skies, the ancient Vulture King hears her pleas and comes down to investigate what's going on. And what's sweet is the Vulture King is an old friend of Lord Rama. But the Vulture King is old and is past his prime. And once, when he sees that Sita is being abducted, he tells Ravana, Oh, Ravana, you should repent. This is a terrible sin. You need to go take Sita back immediately, for this is, this is an error. And Ravana laughs at him and says, I have a boon. I cannot be slain by gods or by demons, nor by spells or magic. Who can stop me? And the vulture king says, I will try to stop you. And Ravana laughs at him and he says, fool king, I will slay you in a moment. But the vulture king says, Rama is my friend and you have wronged him. And so I will fight you to the best of my ability. And so he goes into battle with Ravana. And just as Ravana says, in a few moments, Ravana has pierced him with many arrows and the vulture king fails to rescue Sita and tumbles from the heavens to the earth below where he lays dying until a few hours later, Rama and his brother Lakshman find him there. And the king of the vultures is able to tell Rama where Sita has been taken. And the reason why I tell this story is because I saw a painting of this moment that touched my heart so deeply because in the painting, Rama was cradling the vulture king in his arms and was weeping at the loss of his friend. Even though Rama was the lord of the universe and as Krishna says, you see the bodies fall, I see the spirits rise. Even though Rama was beyond all duality and knew the soul's nature for what it was, when the form of his noble friend fell, he wept for him. And I think that's beautiful to remember that God weeps for us when we fall. God weeps for the noble when they fall and will always go on to make good our deficiencies, to <laughs> make good on our lack. There's another story of Rama that I'll tell one of my favorite attributes of Rama is though he was the consummate warrior and the, the perfect king, he was also a king of compassion. He had such an open and incredible heart. And I don't know if this story is actually true, but I've heard it and it's true to my heart, so I'll tell it anyway. And this is that when Rama and Lakshman were wandering through the forests one day, they came to a beautiful lake, crystal clear, and sparkling blue waters, and they knelt to drink from the water of the lake. And as Lord Rama knelt down, an, a single arrow f tumbled from his quiver. And as it fell to the earth, the tip of, it, of the arrow pierced the belly of a frog lying on the bank of the river. And Lakshman looked down and said, Rama, look, your arrow has pierced this frog. And Rama bent down and he picked up the frog tenderly with both hands. And he said, oh, brother frog, please forgive me that my arrow has pierced you. And the frog says to Lord Rama in his dying croak, oh, blessed Lord Rama, the only gift greater than being pierced by your arrow is to die in your hands. And he gives up the ghost. Isn't that so sweet that even for the life of a frog, even for the smallest of life, the Lord will come down and cradle you in both his hands in those final moments of your passing. And so if all we can be is like that little frog and welcome everything that comes to us and offer ourselves into his hands in the final moments, we too can be free in that light. And in that vein, one of the other stories of Lord Rama that I find deeply inspiring is actually at the zenith of this entire epic, 
that Rama has grown from being a child into being a radiant man and an embodiment of Dharma. He's been banished. He's wandered through the forests as a wanderer. He's fought demons and, and done heroic deeds. His wife has been stolen. He's marshaled an army. He's sieged Lanka and conquered this great, he's fighting against this mighty demon host. And at the final moments, he comes face to face with Ravana, his nemesis, the demon king who he incarnated to destroy. And they're fighting and they're dueling. And it's a terrible fight that Ravana is so powerful. He's not easily overcome. But of course, Rama is Lord Vishnu himself. He's God himself. And so when the moment is right, when it is dharmic for Ravana to fall, Rama pierces him at last with an arrow. And Ravana, his life force flowing out of his body, falls down to his knees. And I've heard it told that Ravana in those last moments, because Ravana actually was a great yogi, he had performed incredible penance, great tapasya to develop incredible, almost indomitable powers. And so he had the power of concentration. He had learned to focus. He just learned how to focus on evil instead of learning how to focus on good. But in those final moments, as he too was pierced by the arrow of Lord Rama, he fell down off his chariot and it said that as he looked out at Rama, who had been his enemy, his, his nemesis, who he is trying to wrong and destroy, he suddenly could perceive that that was God himself. And Rama, Ravana's last words, his dying breath, was just to utter the word Rama in awe, in complete wonderment, for he saw who Rama truly was. And because of that, because dying with the Lord's name on his lips, Ravana was freed from all those transgressions, that he was liberated because he died with the Lord's name on his lips. And that is also an incredible consolation to me. As Sri Yukteswar said, the past lives of all men are dark with many shames, but everything in the future will improve if we are making a spiritual effort now. And so if we can train ourselves to keep the name of Lord Rama, the vibration of God in our hearts all the time, not only will we be able to ascend into a greater sphere of consciousness when we pass away, but every moment is a death. Every moment is a rebirth. And if we can keep the name of Rama, the vibration of God in our heart, then every moment can be a rebirth into a greater and greater spiritual potential. Thank you. I'll share a song now with Tandava, written by Swami Kriyananda, that tells the story of Ram and Sita. Rama was a ruler's son long ago, long ago. Sita was his wife so fair, truly she his life did share. Though much suffering she won long ago, long ago. Ramo Sita Ram. Rama's father banished him far from home, far from home. All alone the woods to roam, Sita gladly shared his doom. Thus his sorrows soon grew dim, far from home, far from home. Ram, 
Homeless wanderers were they Many years, many years Raised in silk in marble halls Now they slept by waterfalls For their bed they gathered hay Many years, many years Ramo Sita Ram. One day came an evil man. Woe the hour, woe the hour. Stole Ram's wife while Ram was gone, carried her to his own home. Thus her soul's dark night began. Woe the hour, woe the hour. Ramo Sita True was she, though sorely pressed, Rama's wife. Rama's wife. Long she spurned the stranger's pleas. Harsh she called his life of ease. Only tested love is blessed. Rama's wife. Rama's wife. Rama Ram at last did win her back. Sorrows fled, sorrows fled. Soon they to their palace went, ended now Ram's banishment. Ended all their years of lack. Sorrows fled, sorrows fled. Ramo Sita Ram. But for Ram and Sita true, long ago. Long ago, love was all their riches still. Palace gold could never fill hearts that heaven's laughter knew. Long ago, long ago. Ramo Sita Ram. Our next story keeps us on the, in India, and it is a fable told from the Buddhist tradition. It's called The Blossom Tree. And the essence of the story talks about the power of friendship, the power of inspiration, and its ability to come from anywhere at any time. But most importantly, the message of the story comes from the power of practicing humility and that when we open our hearts with humility and listen for the divine whispers that come through that practice, through that open-heartedness, then the divine responds. <clears throat> so our story takes place in the ancient city of Benares um, at the time of the Buddha. And there is a bustling in the city, the city of Benares, much like any city in modern times, is 
a dichotomy of rich, deep spiritual practices of people seeking God honestly and openly with their hearts and people living in the world, bustling and trading and flowing in the world of commerce and materialism. And amidst this city, there was a merchant, a very uh, well-established merchant, well-loved merchant in the town, and he was preparing to um, head off on a long journey to take all of his goods for trade and spend time traveling. So on this morning, amidst all of the bustle and the barking dogs and the horses and the carriages and everybody getting ready and toasting the merchant in goodbye and celebrating his journey and his success, the merchant calm and still is moving through the bustle, greeting friends, saying goodbye to others, following through with all of the tasks and the to-do lists that he has. And his friends ask him as they're toasting goodbye, who is it that's going to care for your home, for your workshop, for all of your goods while you are gone? And he responds that his friend Jigmi, the herdsman, is going to care for all of his possessions while he is gone. And his friends laugh, thinking that he's joking. And as they realize that the merchant wasn't joking, that Jigmi, the herdsman, was going to be caring for all of his goods, caring for his home, his warehouses, they became afraid and shocked, and they said, you cannot trust Jigsme, who is a herdsman, someone who's so inferior to you and to all of us in your ranking. You cannot trust him with your goods, with your home. You cannot trust a poor man with wealth. And the merchant smiles and says, Jigme is my friend. He is truthful, honest, and kind of heart, and I trust him with my home and my goods. And the merchant's friends walk away angered and frustrated, not sure what to do. And they come back and they say, uh, they propose to the merchant, let us go to the one they call the Buddha who is preaching under the trees in our city and ask him what is right. For not only do you have our goods and our possessions, uh, I'm sorry, not only do, we have, do you have your own goods and your own possessions in your warehouses, but you have our possessions as well. And if we don't trust Jigme to take care of our goods, then you're putting all of us at risk. So reluctantly, the merchant agrees to go with his friends to the Buddha, and they come and they find him preaching to his disciples under a tree. And the Buddha invites them all to sit down. And the Buddha listens to their predicament. And in response, the Buddha says, I would like to tell you a story. And the Buddha tells the story of an ancient king, long before, the king of the city of Benares, long before the time when he and the disciples are living. And the king's name is Brahmata. And this king lived in his palace amidst a beautiful park that was full of beautiful flowers and trees and fruits and vegetables and everything that the city in, could need. And the king loved to tend to his garden, and he cared for all of his plants, all of the animals, with such tenderness and such joy. But amidst the garden, the tree called the blossom tree is what the king loved most of all. This tree stood much taller than any of the trees around it. Its presence was majestic and grand. Its trunk rising high into the air, its canopy stretching out into the heavens, its roots deeply buried into the ground. It was rumored that this tree was whispering the essence of life itself, that if you could get still enough and quiet enough while sitting under the tree, that the fruits would reveal themselves to you in their blossom, whispering the secrets of life. And King Brahmata loved this tree, and every day would come to it and tend to it, listening to the wind blowing through its leaves with the celestial symphonies of the divine, basking in the shade, feeling its power and its majesty, looking at the magic, listening for all of the joy that the tree shared. But he never noticed, nor did anyone else who was coming to see the tree, the little tuft of kusha grass that was sitting right at the base of the tree. Nobody ever saw it, nobody looked at it, because the tree's grandeur was so big, its presence so magnificent. But the spirit of the tree knew that the grass was there, 
They had been friends for a very long time, whispering to one another, sharing in the glory of this garden, in the glory of the divine with one another. One day the king, sitting in his palace along with his queen, hear a rumbling, and they look around and they realize that one of the large pillars that is holding up his palace has begun to crack, and that if the pillar isn't replaced, that the whole castle, the whole palace would come crumbling down. So he sends his servants quickly out into the gardens, into the parks, to find a tree that will suit to replace the pillar. And the servants are scanning through all of the garden, looking everywhere, trying to find the tree that is large enough, tall enough, strong enough in order to support the pillar that needs to be replaced. And they come back, hung low in despair, and they say to the king, the only tree that we can find that is a suitable replacement for this pillar is your beloved blossom tree. And the king, in despair, goes out and searches through the whole garden saying, no, there must be another tree. We cannot cut down this beloved blossom tree. But through all of his searching, through all of the looking, he comes to realize it's the only option and he's weighing, it's weighing heavy on his heart. What to do? Do I cut down this beloved tree or do I leave the tree and watch my palace collapse? And he ultimately decides that he needs to save the palace for all of the people that are living in it, all of the people that are relying on it. And he reluctantly decides to cut down the blossom tree. And he and the, all of the citizens of the palace and, the white, and his wife, the queen, um, celebrate uh, the tree the night before it's about to be cut off, offering gifts and uh, performing puja and thanking the tree and the spirit of the tree for sacrificing itself for the uh, use of this pillar. And the spirit of the tree, dis in despair at knowing that its home is going to be cut down, asks all of the other spirit trees for help, for advice. What do I do? How do I save my home? And she's calling out, and the call is spread throughout the whole garden, and nobody has an answer. Each of the, spirit tree, each of the spirits in the trees say, I don't know, I'm not, I don't know how to save your home. And the spirit of the blossom tree hears a little whisper coming from the tuft of kusha grass at the, base of, at the base of its trunk. And this little tuft of grass, the spirit of that uh, kusha grass says, I have the answer. I know what to do. And the next morning, as the servants come out into the garden in order to cut down the tree, they come up to the tree and they see that the bark of the tree is gray and discolored, that it looks rotted, like it's rotting from the inside out. And they come up to the tree and they touch the tree and it feels soft to the touch and crumbling apart. And walking around the tree, trying to understand what to do, they ultimately come to the realization that the tree is rotten from the inside out, that it can't be used. The leaves are limping, there are no fruits producing, all of its magic seems to have disappeared. And they walk away, they go back to the king, and they say to him, we need to find another solution. This tree is no longer a viable option. And as they're walking away, the spirit of the tree and all the spirits, uh, spirit trees around are celebrating and laughing in joy. And they ask the, the tree, they ask the spirit of the blossom tree, what did you do? What magic did you perform? And the spirit of the blossom tree says, I had no solutions, but my friend, this little tuft of kusha grass, it taught me the magic of being a chameleon. It taught me how to change the way that I look and the way that I feel to trick the, the people, to trick the servants into thinking that my, tree, that my roots were rotten and that I could not perform the task. And as a result, my home is saved. And the spirit of the tree, of the blossom tree, in its regal majesty, in its power, in its grandeur, whispers to all of the other trees, let us never consider that inspiration must come based on ranking. Let us always look upon every creature with humility and with equanimity, for inspiration flows from everything, whether it be bird, whether it be sky, whether it be tree or grass equally. And when we work together, then we can feel the magic of the divine flowing through each one of us.
and the trees celebrate with one another through the whispers of the, of the divine flowing through the wind, rustling the leaves. And the tree in its majesty is sharing that energy and that essence and that regal beauty all because of this little tuft of kusha grass that knew the solution and that was able to help and to share. And as the Buddha ends his story, he looks upon each of the merchants and smiles at them. And the merchant, in, uh, the merchant who was about to set out on his journey looks around at all of his friends and smiles, knowing that the answer has come. That it is not based on ranking, based on superiority, that it is not based on anything but trust and love and deep humility, that when we can open our hearts and find the answers and find inspiration. And the Buddha closes his eyes as the merchants are standing up to walk away, and he says to them, In a past life, my foremost disciple, Ananda, was the spirit of that blossom tree, and I the spirit of the kusha grass. This is a slight change of mood from that story. We are going to present for you right now a song by Swami Kriyananda, which is called uh, Where Has My Love Gone? It is a mystical love song that tells the story of a lover who has just lost his beloved, and it speaks for the yearning of the human heart. She is left me in my delights. Where is my love, friend, as she this way? Saw you her smile, how what did she say? Ah, ah, she my sweet heart pass she sweet was her promise when first we met this verse of heaven made me forget Heartaches and neighbors are searing me. now she said, you found love again. Up as she my sweet heart passed, she Piercing the darkness, love then was mine. Could she not linger? Must she when she rise and depart like mist on the sea? Ah, ah, my sweet heart passed she Lives 
made of dreams, friend, dreams that must break. Quickly disperse when we awake. Strains that when love calls memory stays, crying across the tides of our days. Ah, past year, my sweet heart past Can you explain these words that she wrote? See me, she said, blow out on the sea. Bound as the reaches of true love must be. Ah, My sweet heart has she Hello, friends. As Sri Yukteswar said in the Autobiography of a Yogi, I shall tell you three stories, each with a moral. <laughs> so brace yourselves. But they're fun stories, too. <laughs> These are stories of Krishna. And we have one story from when he was a, a small toddler, one story from when he was a youth, maybe a teenager or a young man, and one story from his adulthood as king of Dwaraka. But we'll start at the beginning, when he was a little boy. So little Krishna was toddling through the marketplace, and he came across a fruit seller. And this was an old lady, and she had a whole basket of fruit, and she wasn't selling anything that day. And she was, it was gained towards the end of the day. She was very sad. She was very depressed. She hadn't sold any fruit. She needed to get money. And it looked like the day was complete wash, and she was just weeping. And little Krishna toddles up to her, and he says, Why are you crying? What's the matter? And she explains, Well, I, I need to sell my fruit, and I haven't been able to. And Krishna says, Oh, I'll help. I'll buy your fruit. And she says, Oh, that's sweet, but do you have any money? And he says, What's money? And so... She sort of explains, well, when you buy things in the marketplace, you have to have an exchange. You can't just get something for nothing. And little Krishna thinks, and he remembers seeing his parents with tradesmen in the marketplace, and they would take rice and grain and trade it for other goods. So he went, ah, that must be money. And he runs home, and he goes to the pantry, and he finds a bag of rice, and he reaches in, and he grabs as much rice as he can hold, and and he runs off with it, and he's holding on as tight as he can to the rice, but he's got these little tiny hands, and they're sort of chubby, and he's trying to hold the rice, and the little grains are falling out, and he's dropping them all over the place. And he finally gets back to the fruit cellar, and he goes, ta-da! And there's like two, three grains of rice there. And, but the fruit seller just goes, oh, you're so sweet, and she just absolutely falls in love with little Krishna. So she takes... The, th the three grains of rice, and she puts them in her bag, and she gives him some fruit. And he's like, oh, you, 
you can hold another piece of fruit here, have another one. Oh, you want more? Okay. And she keeps loading him up with fruit. And for given that he could carry like three grains of rice, he's holding an awful lot of fruit. So we don't know if he's putting it in his pockets or whatever. Some of it's going straight into his mouth, but she keeps getting fruit, fruit, and Krishna keeps going, yes, yes, more, more, more. And she piles all the fruit in and pops the last berry in his mouth finally, and she's got nothing left. And Krishna goes, thank you, and he waddles off carrying all the fruit. And the woman at this point is just so in love with Krishna that she's forgotten that she was worried that she only got three grains of rice for all her fruit. And she just puts the grains of rice in her empty fruit basket and walks home thinking of Krishna all the way. And she gets home and she takes off her basket. She drops it on the floor and it's suddenly so heavy. And she looks inside and those three little grains of rice turned into a whole basket full of gold and jewels. And the moral of this story is no matter how bad things look, how bleak, just give it all to God. And you'll be repaid a million fold. Second story. This is a story of Krishna, Indra, and the Govardhana mountain. And I'll give this a preface here, because in the Hindu tradition, there are lots of gods. And if you're not used to it, it's worth remembering that we need to keep this distinct from the concept of God, the one ultimate, infinite God. The gods, lowercase, plural, are many, many beings who may have great mystical powers far beyond human beings, but they're not perfected. They're not complete infinite enlightenment by any means, and they have their own faults, they have their own issues, and often the fact that they are so big and powerful compared to us just means that they can act out all of our issues on a much grander scale, which makes for good stories. So Indra was the god of rain and weather, and the people of Krishna's village would pray to Indra that they get the right amount of rain so that their crops would grow, uh, there would be grass for their cows, and, and Indra, for the most part, would listen to their prayers and grant their prayers, and every once in a while he would, he would sort of make sure they weren't getting too cocky, and he'd withhold the rain for a little while, and then he'd let it rain again, just to make sure they didn't stop making their prayers. Well, one year, Indra really got in kind of a snit, and he was feeling like he wasn't appreciated enough. People really ought to be praying to him more. They should recognize his power, and he just stopped all the rain. And the people are praying and praying and praying, and the drought is continuing. All their crops are dying. Their cattle can't find enough uh, grass to graze on, and they keep making their offerings to Indra, and Indra just keeps ignoring them. And Krishna comes along, and Krishna is, a, is perhaps a, a teenager or a young man at this point, and he says, there is no God but the great infinite God. Why, why pray to Indra, who is just being arrogant, just being controlling, just being uh, power mad, and toying with you? You might as well... He is not truly in control. Even Indra, the god of weather, is not ultimately in control. You might as well pray to Govardhana Mountain here. And he gestures to the mountain. And he says, look, you can see even how clouds bump up against the mountain and are caught there and bring rain to our fields. Why not just pray to the mountain? And so the villagers all go, okay, that sounds like a good idea. And they go over there and they start making their pujas to the mountain, because why not? It wasn't working praying to Indra, so they might as well pray to the mountain. And Indra gets really ticked off at this, and he's going, come on, you're supposed to be praying to me. And so he decides to change tactics and completely flood them out, and he starts just bombarding them with rain and thunderstorm, and suddenly everything is getting ready to flood, and so now they have the opposite problem. And so Krishna goes, ah, he lifts up the entire mountain, whoop, and gathers the whole village underneath the mountain. They bring in their cattle, they bring in all their, their families, and Everybody sets up camp under the mountain, and Indra is, is just pouring rain down on them, and it's washing down the sides of the mountain and going off 
uh, and flooding land around them, but all of the villagers are safe underneath. And this goes on for a long time. <coughs> and the villagers are starting to worry that Krishna is going to get tired holding this thing up. And they, they bring sticks and they try and prop up the mountain. And like, isn't that cute? You know, like your, your little sticks are going to do this. And uh, Krishna tries to let the mountain down onto the sticks and the sticks does, just snap. So he holds it up. But Krishna says, oh, don't worry about me, it's fine. And just to prove that it's fine, he holds up the mountain with the tip of his left pinky finger, and he plays his flute with his right hand at the same time, just to prove that this is nothing. Krishna, of course, is not a lowercase god, lowercase g god, like Indra. Krishna is an incarnation of, of God, the Supreme Spirit. And that's what he's representing in this story. And it's trivial for him. Just hold up the mountain, one little finger. And so the villagers, now that they're not worried about Krishna anymore, decide to just enjoy this. And they have just a huge party, and they're playing music, and, and they're, they're making bonfires, and they're dancing around and just having a, a jolly old time, because who wouldn't enjoy just being trapped under a mountain with Krishna for a week? It, it occurs to me that if uh, COVID-19 happened in the time of Krishna, we would have tales now of everybody individually being uh, quarantined with Krishna. <laughs> you are alone in your house, but Krishna is with you. Krishna is with you. Krishna is with you. And how glorious it would be because we all have our own Krishna quarantined with us, which, by the way, we do. But back to our mountain. Indra keeps pounding rain down on the mountain, and he keeps it up for a week. <coughs> Seven days and seven nights, the rain pours down, and the villagers are still just having a delightful time with Krishna under the mountain. And finally, Indra realizes the error of his ways, and he stops the rain. And he comes to Krishna, and he says, I realize I have been arrogant, I have been proud, I have been cruel. Please forgive me. And Krishna naturally forgives him. And the villagers move out from under the mountain. They set it back down. Indra starts bringing the correct amount of rain again. They resurrect all their crops. Their cattle have grass to graze on again. And all is well. And the moral of the story is sort of twofold. For the villagers, be like the villagers. Put your trust in God and just do your best. You know, plant your plants, tend your cattle, and trust to God to provide what God needs to provide, like the rain. And if you happen to be in Indra's case and you make severe errors, just be humble enough to admit them, renounce them, and ask for forgiveness, because God will forgive you. Last story. And now Krishna is king of Dwaraka. And one day, two other kings come to visit him. These kings are Duryodhana and Yudhisthira whose names you will remember from the Mahabharata. Duryodhana is king of the Kauravas, who represent uh, the bad guys in the Mahabharata, and his, he has a, a reputation for being greedy and arrogant and evil. Yudhisthira is king of the Pandavas, the good guys in the Mahabharata story, and everyone reveres him as a, a wise and loving king. And these two kings are before Krishna. And Duryodhana has a complaint. He says, Krishna, why does everybody hate me? Why does everybody say I'm such an awful, evil person? And Krishna says, I will answer you tomorrow. In the meantime, I want you to go back to your kingdom and bring me back one good person from your kingdom. And Duryodhana walks off sort of grumbling, Raja Fraja Goth, find a good person. And he leaves, and Krishna turns to Yudhisthira. And while he's doing that, I want you to go back to your kingdom and find me one bad person. And Yudhisthira says, as you wish, my lord. And so he leaves too. The next day, Duryodhana and Yudhisthira both appear. And Krishna says, I see you each here alone. Didn't I ask you to bring someone with you, each of you? And Duryodhana says, I looked through my whole kingdom. There are people who look good, but I just know they've got something wrong with them. And I'm sure as soon as my back is turned, they're all rogues and they're all causing problems. I couldn't find anybody who's good. How about you, Yudhisthira? And Yudhisthira said, I looked through my entire kingdom. 
And everyone I looked at, I could see for all their faults, they're just manifestations of God. And how could a manifestation of God be evil? Krishna looks back at Duryodhana and says, you see, you see evil in everyone, and that is what people see in you. Yudhisthira sees good in everyone, and that is what they see in him. And the moral of that story was that. <laughs> Thank you. So the next, this next song that I'm going to present is called Why. And uh, this song is also a story. And interestingly enough, Swami Kriyananda uh, wrote about this song, saying this was the story of his life. And then he also said, this is the story of a tender maid. He said, I'm not a tender maid, <laughs> but it is the story of my life. But he did say, I have a very tender heart. There lived a tender maid in a far off country. The strangeness of this world made her sigh. Her friends as their fathers for money and clothes But all she could ask was Why? She saw the solemn clouds Gathered watching a rainbow the bright rays of their joy filled the sky. Her teachers explained it all wisely away, but still her heart wondered. silent stars through the night with their gladness they seemed some wondrous truth to imply her elders all slept but the magic of night awoke her to ponder smile as she tended her baby. A widow weep that love had to die. The joy of new friends and the sadness of parting, all these made her ask God. secret of oneness, the bond not even time can untie. For love then possessed her and made her his own. In love she at last learned.
It's a little hard to say anything after that song. It must have been the last piece of the day, <laughs> if we had planned better. Uh, namaste, friends. The story I want to share with you today is the story is a story from the life of Swami Shankara. And it is a story of how the four primary disciples of Swami Shankara, his successors, how they all got their monastic name. So even before I start with the story, I want to uh, share a little bit about Swami Shankara. Um, I'm sure all of you who have read the autobiography of, of a yogi are familiar with this great character. He, is, he was a great Indian sage. In fact, he was more than a sage. He was an avatar. He was a fully realized being. And Yogananda refers to him many times in the autobiography of a yogi, uh, the most prominent being in the chapter where Yogananda takes his monastic vows. And he calls uh, Swami Shankara the father of uh, the Swami order, the monastic order from India. And also Swami Shankara was one of the first proponents of using the word Satchidananda uh, to refer to God as the absolute name uh, for God. The word uh, translates into ever-conscious, ever-existing, ever-new bliss. And there are multiple other mentions of his name in the autobiography of a yogi. But what's most interesting about Swami Shankara's life is uh, later in Swami Kriyananda's life, uh, multiple times, Swamiji, as we like to refer to him, he uh, wondered and uh, proposed many times that Swami Shankara was in fact an incarnation of Yogananda in his previous life. So, and for me, that has been very interesting because I grew up with stories from the life of Swami Shankara. In my family, uh, we followed the tradition of Swami Shankara and I was very familiar with this life and was very familiar. And I always found myself in tune uh, with his life and his teachings. So it was uh, personally very beneficial and touching for me to hear Swamiji says that. And I could tune in more deeply into the life of this great saint and avatar who lived in India. And uh, his life was very interesting. He was uh, like William the Conqueror and Ferdinand III, which were all prior incarnations of Yogananda. Shankara was a great warrior, but not the kind of warrior you might imagine. Uh, externally, he was a religious mendicant. He was a renunciate. He became renunciate at the age of six or seven when he was very, very young. He took the sannyasa vows. Uh, he flouted all the rules uh, from the very beginning of his life. But he was a warrior of a very different kind. And uh, during those days in India, uh, the highest for art, the highest talent, what was most respected was not military power, was not physical forces. It was, the, uh, it was the power of the word. Language and philosophy were considered the highest of skills. And that way, Shankara conquered the entire country. In fact, interestingly enough, historically, when we look back, we see that without Swami Shankara, Sanatan Dharma or the Hindu religion, the religion of the Vedas, would not exist as we know it today. He traveled all around the country and he battled with words. And anybody who lost the battle had to follow him. So he, he, all, he traveled throughout the span of India and he even marked the boundaries of the country. And he established religious institution at every corner of the country in four cardinal directions in order to establish Sanatan Dharma of the Vedas as the religion of this land. And he drove away all the other faiths and superstitions that existed in the country at that time. So uh, you can easily re relate to how uh, he could have easily been Yogananda in a previous life. Now, his life has so many interesting stories, and uh, it would probably take a long time for me to go through his entire life story and talk about all the things he did. He lived a very short life, in fact, like Jesus. He only lived for about 32 or 33 years, but he did a lot during those years. Now, I want to talk about four disciples of Shankara. He had four disciples that he considered his successors and he appointed them as the heads of four religious institutions in four corners of the country in four cardinal directions north south east and west and i'm going to tell you the story of how these four disciples got their monastic name and a little bit about each one of them now the first disciple i'm going to talk about is uh, i think perhaps shankara's first disciple to amongst these four his name was padmapada 
Now, Padmapada started following Shankara at a very early age. It's even likely that Padmapada was elder to Shankara because Shankara became a renunciate, a saint, and a teacher very early, perhaps, you know, well before even his teenage years. So it's likely that some of these disciples were even older than Shankara. So I don't know what the pre-monastic name of Padmapada was, uh, but Padmapada was very, very devout. He was very scholarly, very wise. He studied uh, the Advaita philosophy with Shankara and he translated the scriptures and he reinterpreted the Vedas and a lot of the ancient writings of the Hindu texts. But what he was most known for was his devotion to the Guru for was uh, how obedient he was to Shankara's command and how even every thought of Shankara was his command. And he was perfectly in tune with Shankara to always know what the Guru was thinking. And uh, the most beautiful story told about Padmapada is when one day Shankara was standing on the banks of a river and Padmapada was on the other side. And Shankara called him uh, by his name, pre-monastic name, to come up to him. And uh, anything that Shankara said, uh, his disciple was so used to being perfectly in tune with and carrying out exactly as Shankara wished. And as soon as he said that, he immediately started walking towards Shankara, not even realizing or acknowledging that there is a deep river dividing uh, the two of them. And as he started walking, the story is told that lotus flowers started gathering and they started appearing out of the water to hold his feet so he wouldn't drown into the water. And that way he was able to walk on the surface of the river and reach the other bank to meet Shankara. So that's how he got his name Padmapada, which means uh, lotus feet, because his feet were always held by the lotus uh, of Guru's grace, but also from the story of walking on water with the lotus flower holding him high uh, from drowning. And uh, the next disciple I'm going to move on to was this other disciple. Uh, his name was Giri. That was his pre-monastic name. And he also was very devoted to Shankara, but he was different from Padmapada. He was not all that uh, book smart. Uh, he did not always understand all the philosophy. He didn't have that great a command over language that he could express all of it as lucidly as Shankara or Padmapada would. He couldn't discourse. He couldn't write uh, commentaries, at least at this stage in his life. But he really, really liked to serve <clears throat> Shankara, and he did that very well. And every morning, uh, Shankara would uh, gather all of his disciples and give a discourse. And he would also do puja and a lot of worship and other practices during the morning time. And during the day, the disciples would gather flowers for all these uh, ritual practices. And Giri was responsible for gathering flowers, and he was in the garden picking flowers. And he, did, he lost track of time. And it was already time for Shankara to start the discourse for the day, and the, all the disciples were gathered, including Padmapada and many others. Now, uh, ev everybody was getting late and they were getting anxious that Giri was not here because he had to attend this class. And Shankara said, I'm not going to start until Giri shows up. So they're all wondering, when is this guy going to come? And Padmapada, although he was a great disciple, during this time, he was a little bit, uh, he was not living up to his highest potential. He was a bit critical of Giri and the fact that he was this man was just oblivious to everything happening. So he commented to Shankara, you might as well start lecturing. The stone walls would perhaps understand what you're saying uh, better than Giri uh, because he was uh, not considered the wisest or uh, somebody who was known for his uh, knowledge of philosophy or language. And Shankara just smiled. He didn't respond. He said, I'm not going to start until Giri comes. And uh, finally, Giri shows up. And Shankara says, Giri, would you like to sing, you know, would you like to present a poem for me at this very moment? And Giri, you know, he does not, uh, he does not write poems. He's not language and Sanskrit and philosophy are not his strengths. And Shankara asks him to compose a poem in this extremely complex meter. It's a poetic meter uh, called Totaka in Sanskrit. And this is such a difficult poetic meter that there is no, no known composition or poetry existing in this meter at all. And here, Shankara is asking this uh, lay disciple who is not even um, as uh, learned or wise as some of his other disciples to compose uh, this poem in this extremely strange and complex meter. And the beauty of the story is as soon as Shankara says that, 
<clears throat> Totaka starts singing this song and it just flows out of his mouth in the perfect poetic meter of Totaka. It is such a complex meter that all the disciples are just completely shocked. They're just, they don't know where this poem is coming from. So that was a beautiful, uh, perhaps I'll say, uh, share a verse from this poem. It's of course in Sanskrit, but even as I say it, you will hear how complex this meter is. I will just share the first line of the poem. This is just one line. Viditakhila Shastra Sudha Jalade Mahitopa Nishat Katitartha Nide Hridaye Kalaye Vimalam Charanam Bhava Shankara Deshikame Charanam so this is just one line of that meter and the exact measurements of where all the syllables fall have to match with every verse. So uh, this disciple Giri just on the spot spontaneously composes this uh, incredible piece of poetry and recites it in front of Shankara. And this was the lesson that Shankara was teaching all of his other disciples including Padmapada because Giri's strength, a disciple's strength did not come from how learned they were, how scholarly they were but just from how in tune they were with their guru. Because Giri was so perfect in his attunement with Shankara, because he was uh, so always willing to follow his guru's instructions and always uh, tune into his consciousness, the guru could sing that song through him, could compose that complex poem through even somebody who was not that learned or book smart. And from that point on, uh, this disciple Giri, he got the monastic name Totaka, which was just the name of the poetic meter uh, in which he composed this one song when Shankara asked him to, because it was such a strange feat that that became his name and from then on everybody referred to him, to him as Totaka. Now, uh, I'll move on to the third disciple. The third disciple, again, I don't know this person's pre-monastic name, but this is a very interesting story. Again, somewhere in South India, Shankara was traveling and he reaches this world, uh, this uh, village, of Brahmins. And uh, this village has around 2,000 Brahmins and they're all extremely devoted, very learned, very, very spiritually advanced and very pious. Um, they devoted all their time meditating and performing sacred fire rituals and were always tuning into the divine. And Shankara was very pleased to spend some time in this village. And uh, he met with a lot of Brahmins who were running this village and performing all these sacred rites. There was this one Brahmin in that village. His name was Prabhakara. And he was one of the most learned, most wise, and very, very pious and devoted Brahmin who made a lot of offerings to Shankara. And he was very, very humble. And this man had a son. This son was a little unusual. For all practical purposes, people considered him just crazy. Um, he wouldn't. He was a young man. He was grown up. He was not a child anymore. He was initiated into the sacred practices. He was. He had a sacred threat ceremony as any Brahmin would, and he was initiated into the Gayatri mantra and all the sacred fire rituals. But he did not perform any of them. He just sat on mounds of sand all day, staring at the sun and just rolling himself and just sitting there, looking and staring at things without doing anything throughout his entire day. But not only that, he was also extremely handsome. This was a very, very magnetic person, but he was just crazy, or at least perceived as crazy by everyone around him. Now Prabhakara, his father, who was a very pious and devoted Brahmin, approached Shankara, I don't know what to do with my son. You, I know you were a great, great realized being. I really hope you can help me here. I don't know what to do of him. I don't know why he is this way. And Shankara says, sure, I will go look at him. I'll speak with him. I'll see what I can do. And Shankara goes up to this uh, crazy young man and asks him, who are you? And as soon as this person uh, sees Shankara, he realizes who has come up to him. This is no ordinary saint. This is no ordinary teacher or Brahmin. This is no ordinary sannyasi. This is in fact a fully realized soul who has come to greet him. And immediately he becomes humble. He becomes respectful. And he uh, starts to speak with Shankara in a normal way and not in any crazy fashion. And Shankara asks him, who are you? What are you? Why are you doing this? And then this man, just like Totaka, spontaneously in the moment, starts reciting another poem. I'm not going to share that with you. Uh, but essentially, he starts reciting these 12 verses, describing to Shankara who he is. 
And then you realize this is after all not a crazy man. He's an extremely evolved, realized being who just does not relate to the world around him because he's just way ahead of them. And in this poem that he recites to Shankara, he says, I'm not this body, I'm not this mind, I'm, I'm not a Brahmin, I'm not any of the elements, I'm not... Uh, I am not the reflection that you see on the water. I am the soul. I am the knowledge of the true self. And he goes on to describe who he is to Shankara. And Shankara smiles at him and says, I would like to accept you as a disciple. Would you like to join me and travel with me throughout the country? And, you know, he already recognized who Shankara was. Shankara was not only a great realized being, but Shankara was, in fact, his own guru. So from that point, uh, this person becomes a disciple of Shankara and he becomes a monastic. He is no longer crazy because he doesn't need to actually do those rituals. That's why he did not, uh, in fact, engage with in them, even while he was with his parents, because he was meant to be a true renunciate, a sannyasi who was above and beyond rituals. And Shankara gave him the name Hasta Malaka. What that means is Hasta is hand and Amalaka is a gooseberry or a fruit. Uh, Shankara gave him that name because realization and grace uh, to him were like a fruit already dropped on his hand. In this particular incarnation, he did not have to try or work for it at all. He was born in an extremely highly realized state. So he became a very devout disciple of Shankara and he also followed him in all his travels. Now the fourth disciple of Shankara uh, has a very long story. I'm going to give a summarized version of what his life was and uh, what he did and how he became a disciple of Shankara and what his name was. Again, I have to say, all these are true characters. These there are historical records of all these different disciples I'm describing to you. Of course, there is historical record of Swami Shankara as well. But all these disciples, they did a lot of great work in these four institutions that they that Shankara established and they headed. And even today, all these four institutions have successors of these four gurus who uh, had their lineage, all starting from Swami Shankara, and they wrote their own works of philosophy as well. Now. The fourth disciple of Swami Shankara, who became one of his successors, his pre-monastic name was Mandana Mishra. Now, interestingly enough, these other three disciples, they met Shankara in South India, and Shankara appointed them as heads of institutions in East, West, and North of India. Padmapada was the head of uh, the Govardhanamat, which Shankara established in Puri, which is in the eastern coast of India. And there Shankara established this mutt near the shrine. Mutt is a religious institution or an ashram, um, basically some a place of religious worship that people look up to, and also a monastic institution. And in Puri, the presiding deity is Jagannath or Lord Krishna in the form of the Lord of the Universe. And uh, Shankara established a mutt in the sacred site and he made Pad uh, Padmapada the head of that institution uh, to take on and carry the work after Shankara left his body. And in the north, he established uh, what he called Jyoti Mutt, uh, the, the institution of light. Uh, today, this particular ta hill town is called Joshi Mutt, and it is right at the base of the sacred temple of Badrinath. So he established this ashram uh, right below the Badrinath shrine, and Badrinath has uh, this form of uh, Vishnu uh, named Narayana. Uh, it is the incarnation of Vishnu from Satya Yuga where he did penance and it's a very sacred temple that Shankara had a lot of associations with. And in the east, there is this, again, on the shores, on the seashore, there is the ancient town of Dwaraka. Dwaraka was the town which Krishna, when he became a ruler, he ruled this town and he was a great emperor. And the form of Krishna in this particular uh, town on the west coast is Dwaraka Adish, or the emperor of this land of Dwaraka. And in that particular spot, he established a mart or an institution and he made Hastamalaka the leader or the uh, person responsible for that institution. And in South, he made Mandana Mishra. I'm going to come to his monastic name just in a bit. But Mandana Mishra, uh, Shankara actually met him in Central or North India, not in South. And he brought him to South and he sent the others to the other three institutions. That's the interesting fact that I wanted to share. 
So Mandana Mishra was a very, very learned man. Not only was he very learned, he was looked up to as the absolute exponent of all the Vedas. There was this great uh, sage named Kumari Labhatta who was considered an exponent. And because that man had chosen a different uh, pr progression for his life, he had decided to repent for his sins and do a great penance. Uh, Mandana Mishra was now considered the biggest exponent of the Vedas in all of the land, in all of India. But interestingly, Mandana Mishra's philosophy was very ritual based. He was an exponent in what um, is traditionally referred to as Karma Kanda in India, in the Sanatan Dharma faith. What that means is his perspective and understanding of the scriptures was entirely based on rituals. What you do in order to appease what gods, why is it important to do that, what are the rules for doing this, what are the rules for not doing it. That was his primary orientation towards religion and to scriptures and to the Vedas. And he was a great exponent. He was a very spiritual soul and he led a very pious life doing all of these rituals. Shankara, as I already mentioned, he was not a man of rules, so to say. He, he came to redefine Sanatan Dharma. He completely revolutionized the Hindu faith. As uh, Yogananda mentions uh, in the autobiography of a yogi uh, quite a few times, this biblical verse, the Sabbath was made for the man and not man for the Sabbath. And Shankara really carried that out in his life in a very dramatic way. He broke the rules if it uh, was meant to serve, if it was not serving the highest spiritual purpose. So he wanted to meet this great exponent uh, of the Vedas and to uh, refute his faith, to refute his philosophy so Shankara could present his Advaita philosophy and to establish that as the most supreme. So he goes to this remote village in central India and finds this man. This man, interestingly, had a very, very spiritual wife. Her name was Ubhaya Bharati. And the most interesting part of the story is somehow his wife was most, more spiritually advanced even than Mandana Mishra or even Swami Shankara because both of them looked up to this lady and worshipped her. Uh, Shankara considered her a perfect incarnation of Divine Mother herself. Now Shankara meets Mandana Mishra, this great exponent of the Vedas, this great scholar, and he invites him to a verbal battle, to an argument, to a debate. And uh, any time a scholar approaches you, and if you happen to be a scholar, and if they offer a debate or an argument, then you have to either accept it or accept defeat. So Mandana Mishra has no option but to accept this invitation for this debate with Swami Shankara. And the way this was going to work is both of them will ask each other very, very tough questions. In fact, Mandana Mishra was going to ask most of the questions to Shankara because he's the one who approached asking for this debate. And if Shankara um, uh, answers all these questions in a perfect way to the full satisfaction of everybody, then Mandana Mishra ultimately has to accept defeat. And not only that, in these type of debates, whoever is defeated has to become the disciple of the other person. So that's how, uh, you know, these things worked in, in ancient India and that's how Shankara conquered the entire country during his times. And both of them agree that the judge for this debate should be Mandana Mishra's wife because she was an extremely evolved spiritual soul. She never taught philosophy, she never lectured, but her understanding was so pure and so perfect that she knew all of this already. So, uh, Mandana Mishra and Shankara start debating. They take, they take breaks for meditation, lunch and sleeping, but it goes on for days. They just keep asking questions and Shankara answers and Shankara is able to answer everything um, to Ube Bharati's satisfaction, to the satisfaction of the judges and all those scholars gathered around to witness this debate. So, this goes on for a while and it's becoming apparent that Shankara is winning. So Mandana Mishra thinks, how can I defeat this man? You know, I cannot let him win over me in this debate. And then he realizes Shankara flouted the rules of the Vedas and he did not go through all stages of life. He was a young boy, he was a toddler and then he became a 
you know, a kid. And then he just decided to become a sannyasi. He did not go through all the stages of being a youth, being a married man, or being a one, uh, you know, um, one prastha or a family uh, man living in the forest as a renunciate and finally embracing sannyasa in the later stages of his life. Uh, Shankara basically said, those rules were not meant for me and he became a sannyasi at the age of six or seven. So Mandana Mishra realizes that Shankara has no idea about family life how to lead family life or the relationship between a husband and a wife. So he immediately takes a different diversion in debate and rather than asking questions on Vedic philosophy and the scriptures, he starts questioning Shankara on the family relationships between a man and a woman. And Shankara right now is stuck. He doesn't know how to answer these questions because he has no experience, at least in that incarnation, of how any of that worked. Uh, so finally, Shankara decides to take a break. He says he needs some time to prepare. <laughs> and then uh, he leaves the debate and he takes some days or weeks or months, in fact, to prepare in order to... Um, both refine his consciousness and to understand all levels of existence, all ways in which we relate with Maya and the world and the spiritual potential and the principles involved in all of those. And he tries to absorb and learn that through intuition. What he does is in fact the king, a great king in that land ruling in this part of the country, he dies and his body is lying there. And Shankara, uh, he leaves his body through teleportation, I believe, and he enters the body of this king. And he, in fact, lives through the life experiences of the king. He uh, learns from his memory, and then he comes back to the body of Shankara uh, to gain all those experiences indirectly. Uh, now, that's the best way I can explain the story, but I'm sure you get the point. And then he goes back to argue with Mandana Mishra. And now his wife still is judging this debate. And at this point, Shankara is able to answer all of his questions, including questions on family relationship and how husband and wife relate to each other and all of that. And the end of this, obviously you already know it's not a surprise, Mandana Mishra finally has to accept defeat. So he becomes a disciple of Shankara and he starts following Shankara throughout all of his travels and around the country. And Shankara gives him the name Sureshwara, or the head, the ruler of all the gods, ruler of the heavens. So this is the story of how these four great souls, all of whom were different from each other, they all became disciples of Shankara, they all embraced that monasticism, and they became the torch bearers of the Advaita tradition that Shankara established throughout India, and they became heads of these religious institutions that exist even today. So I hope you enjoyed, you all enjoyed this morning with all the different stories of different flavors and kinds and the music that we presented. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, let us end this morning with a prayer. Divine Mother, Heavenly Father, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar, our dear Guru Paramhansa Yogananda, saints of all religions, dear friend Swamiji, thank you for the blessing of your presence in our lives. Help us stay inspired. Help us keep our energy always high. Guide us to live in joy. Take us home. Oh, peace. Amen.